Um, so welcome to today's fourth session of our Journalism at UL Media Matters Autumn Seminar Series. We're delighted to be joined this afternoon by uh, Mr. David Burke. Um, based in Ennis, uh, David has been involved in video production and editing in various capacities for, uh, for, for, for many years now, but has in recent years established himself as a very significant talent in producing and directing three critically acclaimed documentaries, um, Ross Talton, Crash, Crash and Burn, and um, Father of the Cyborgs. The last of which, uh, Father of the Cyborgs, um, was selected for this year's Tribeca Film Festival in New York and is showing in Irish cinemas now. Um, I, I think it's beating James Bond uh, in the, the, the current box office um, uh, numbers, David. Am I right? I haven't, I haven't checked, but I would, I would assume so, you know. <laughs> um, it's it's there anyway, um, and I, I know it played Limerick last week. I, I'm not sure whether it's 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 still there um, th this week. But at first glance, an Irish cycle race um, a failed Formula One driver and a neuroscientist um, going out on a limb might seem quite far apart as subjects. But there is a common theme, I suppose. Uh, the documentaries focus on brilliant individuals with world-class potential who, despite their talents, essentially run into trouble and skirt with failure and disaster. I suppose David, David's been less interested in the genius of uh, his subjects than the flaws which can permeate genius. Um, and they're, they're really terrific pieces of work. And I'm very excited uh, to, to see what he does next. Um, so I've known David for a long time, and every time I meet him, he has several uh, outlandish ideas about new uh, uh, pieces of work. The energy and time and passion he puts into bringing them to the screen uh, really is amazing. Um, and it's this process that he's going to talk to us about today. Um, like, where do ideas come from? Um, how, how do you develop them? And how do you get them up there on the screen for people to see? So he's asked that this be uh, kind of an informal uh, session, really. So where questions arise, just raise your hand um, and uh, t t t turn on the cameras, if you like. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'll just uh, hand hand you over to David. So thanks. Thanks for coming in, David. Thanks, William Fergie, for having me. And thanks to the rest of you for coming along for the talk today. Um, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to briefly basically give three really brief case studies on the previous documentaries I've done. And by doing that, I hope you basically get a, a really good overview of, as Fergus said, how do you take an idea and how do you actually get it on the screen? And, uh, and basically we'll look at all the basic little elements, boxes that you need ticked to actually basically turn it, get a project and bring it to fruition. And briefly look at as well, the places and avenues that you can go for funding. But I think the most important thing that I can instill in anyone today is it's how to get your first project made. How do you go from someone who has made nothing with no directing or producing credentials on your CV? How do you get that first project over the line? Because there's this kind of catch-22 in, in, in documentaries and in TV in general. If you've never produced anything, if you've never directed anything, how do you get your first commission? Because that's one of the things commissioning editors look for. The, one of the first questions they ask is, what have you done? And if the question, your answer to that question is, well, actually, I've done nothing. Or I've, you know, you may have worked on projects as a sound assistant or something like that, but you don't have any direct experience directing, producing. How do you get over that line? How do you get over that first bump? Because it's a really difficult one to get over. Um, and I think the most important thing that I could say is start yourself. Just get a camera, and if you have an idea that you're really interested in, and there's a character that you have access to, just start. What are you waiting for? You say you don't have a camera. You do. You've got one in your phone. And by that, I mean, I know Sony, for example, they funded a short documentary a couple of years ago, and it was made all on their phone. It was just to prove the, the level of their cameras that, but it can be done. So just start your project. Start filming, because it's the only way. You, you, so anyway, firstly, you learn so much. But then at least you have some material to take forward to actually show to the commissioning editors. Um, I'll just give you an example of what I'm talking about. There was a chap from Dublin. He was into jujitsu. That's fine. That was his interest. And that's one of the things that I would mention, I should I may mention as well, is that if you're going to work on a project, 
work on something that you're genuinely interested in. This is just my own philosophy, by the way. You can take it with a pinch of salt if you wish. Um, working on stuff that you're not interested in has been very successful for some, for some people. But you generally end up making programs like about you know doing up garden sheds. It's just passionless. If you're going to work, with, personally, I think if I'm going to work on something, I have to be 100% interested in it because it just just doesn't justify the time and effort that it takes to to, to actually make these things happen. So. I, to go back to the story I was going to give about, it's Gavin Fitzgerald, his name is, he's a director from Dublin, brilliant guy. So he went down to the Long Mile Road and in his words, his exact words were to him was, he went down filming lads baiting the heads off one another. Now, as it turns out, one of these, these guys turned out to be Conor McGregor. Now, whatever you make him, McGregor is another story, but McGregor, so he started following McGregor. He, he could see way back years and years ago that this guy had something about him. So Gavin subsequently got a TV series in RTE following McGregor. And then that spawned, you know, it was initially a one-off doc documentary about McGregor. That spawned into the series about McGregor. And that spawned subsequently into the feature documentary about Conor McGregor, which I think was the most successful Irish documentary ever in the box office. So by just starting, by just following his interest, by just following something, you know, he had access to a unique character by making his own look. And that's how he got his break. So to take you back to my initial point about commissioning editors, if you come to someone and you've nothing on your CV, as I said, how do you get over the first line? But he could legitimately go to commissioning editors and say, look, this guy is like a new sports Irish superstar. We've already got all of this footage of him and I've got access, unique access to him. And that's one of the ways that you can certainly get over the line. So I would, like I said, I would say, like just film something, just start your project, and you will opportunities will arise in inadvertently through that. If, for example, your project involves going to, you know, Antarctica, fair enough, might be slightly more difficult. But don't forget about the project, and maybe, maybe what you should do is is maybe work on a short documentary. I think that's a really interesting way that you can get a project off the ground as well, because you, they don't have to be. I mean, a feature documentary and our documentary is an awful lot of work goes into that. But you can make a really nice, sharp documentary. If there's some an interesting character in your locality, you make a lovely piece for five, ten minutes. Fantastic way. And then what you should do is submit that project into a film festival. So, for example, there's great film festivals in Dublin, there's Cork, there's Galway. They'd be the three biggest in Ireland. There's actually Docs Ireland as well, a new festival in Belfast. They'd be the four ones I would personally target if I was anyone. Get your sharp doc into one of those festivals. Make it yourself if needs be. And then you can say, well, what have you done? I've actually made the sharp doc, which was selected for X festival. It won't do you any harm, you know? And then when you go and attend the festival, that's where you actually inadvertently, you know, you rub shoulders with, with the commissioning editors. They'll have talks with the commissioning editors about what they're looking for for the next year. So and go up and talk to them afterwards. Say, well, like, this is who I am. I just like to introduce myself. You know, I'm just asking for advice. Maybe you have an idea. That's what they're there for. The commissioning editors are actually there to get ideas. That's their job, you know what I mean? So don't be afraid to pitch them ideas. If they go to a festival and they come back with one pondinger of an idea, that's, you know, they've done their job. Like I said, that's what they're there for. So don't be afraid to pitch them ideas either. A um, couple of places so that you can kind of get funding from um, assuming that you have, I mean, you don't have to, you don't necessarily, you don't have to go off Start, start filming a project or anything like that. I just think it's a good idea. Um, but you do need, to, if you are going to apply for funding, you're going to need to have every box ticked. Some of the boxes, the most obvious box you need ticked is you need a really strong idea. And you need to look at the scheme that you're applying for and see does your idea you know, fall, fall under that criteria. But one of the, I, I mentioned the second question that they'll ask is what have you done? If you haven't done anything, what you can do, and it's a good idea, is team up with them, find a company, look at their work that you like, what, what, what documentaries have you seen in the last year that you thought was really good? Research the company that did it and maybe approach them. Say, listen, I've got this nice idea. Do you fancy teaming up with me? So that's, a, that's another way of doing it. Again, if you're going to go to a company like that, I think it's a good idea that you've, you've already built up a rapport with, with the main people. I think it just makes it kind of, it's your idea, not theirs. You know what I mean? That you don't want to be handing over your idea to another company. I've seen it happen in the past where someone inexperienced went to an experienced company with a really good idea and you find it and it may have been just by accident rather than anything more insidious but the person who came initially with the idea they're slowly sidelined and slowly sidelined until they have a very periphery idea 
I, you know, their credit is ID initially generated by X, you know what I mean? So you have to be very careful that that doesn't happen yet. And the main way, another way, like I said, the main way of doing that is you building up the rapport with, with, with the main character for want of a word. So I mentioned short documentaries. The Screen Ireland, who used to be the film board, they have short documentary schemes. That's a good place to start, I think, because you're not looking for 100,000 euros or whatever X, you know, for a documentary that's going to cost 300,000. You're looking at, I think, maybe 25,000 to make a documentary. And that's a really good starting point. You know, you're not going off making an epic or anything like that. But in, like I said, you're going to, I, if you are going to apply to Screen Ireland for a short documentary scheme, you would have to have some, you know, you would have to have an experienced production company with you, I think, I think in order to, to get it made, or an exper experienced producer. They'll also ask, who's the cameraman? Who's the sound person? Who's the editor? So it's not just good enough that you have a kick-ass idea. It's not good enough that you have a kick-ass um, production company behind you. You're really going to need every box ticked. Who is working on this? You need to make sure that the whole thing is really safe. You know, they, they look at this project and they can see that it's in safe hands, you know? Especially if you have a track record behind you. They look at it even more carefully because they're going to need, well, this person may need, you've got a really great idea. I'm looking at the treatment. It looks very impressive. They're going to make sure they're going to need to safeguard their investment, I guess, as much as anything else. Um, very briefly, I'll run through a few other little places that you can get um, funding from. We won't dwell too much on these because I'll inadvertently come back to them again. So there's obviously RTE. There's the IPU and RTE. That's the Independent Production Unit. That, that's where all the commissioners are based. If you go onto their website, you'll see every season they list their, their remit, what they're actually looking for, you know? So you, you might have an idea they think is great, but it may not actually fall under their remit at all. So just, it's, 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 worth, it's actually worth checking out anyway. And another thing I'd say in regards to that is if, for example, you have a documentary about a GA pair for argument's sake, and you're pitching it to, you, you think you've found a commissioning editor, but then look at what that commissioner editor has um, actually funded in the past. They may have no interest in GA. You may be pitching it to the wrong person, you know? So just be careful that you're pitching your idea to the right person as well. Um, there's the BAI Broadcast Authority of Ireland. You, you would have heard their, their name mentioned in the radio. You know, they, they're, they're all over media. And they fund kind of a cultural scheme as well. So what, what you need to do is it's stories of cultural relevance to Ireland. Now, in order to, plot, to apply to them, you need to get a broadcaster involved in the first place. So what will happen is you approach the broadcaster again, I've got X idea, it ticks all the boxes for, for broadcast, the BAI's uh, funding scheme, and then they'll give you a letter and then you can subsequently apply to the scheme, but you have to get the broadcaster on board first, or it's not a runner. Um, a lot of sorry, yeah. Just a quick question in there um, from Adam. Uh, Adam has no audio, so uh, he, he just uh, uh, put it in the text box. Yeah, it's just, uh, just his question was for indie documentary filmmaking outside of festivals. Um, he's asking what kind of avenues are there for distribution and finding audiences? That's pretty much it. Well, what you need to really do is some documentaries, and they could be high, big end documentaries as well, but they're technically, you know, if they're more kind of an artistic strand, they could technically be um, an art festival doc, is what they call it, really. It's not necessarily. What you can do is you can get selected for festivals all around the world. You could play in 50, 60 festivals, but, and you may get two or 300 euros for each time you get screened and the festivals will pay you for it. But that may be it. I mean, the majority of documentaries do not make money. Just be very clear about this. Um, the way I pay my money is, I, may, I make my money is I pay myself. I make sure that on the budget line, I have my line, director, producer, whatever, office manager, and I get, that's why I pay myself. And that's room fence. I'm not relying on anything to come in afterwards. Um, I'll talk about that again when, 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 when I kind of talk about the Pacific documentaries I've done. But that's it. Another, and then subsequently, what you should do is if um, a lot of sales agents, they attend the festivals, and that's where they pick up projects. So they see, so for example, our last got into Tribeca. So we were quids in, we had no problems getting a sales agent because it, we're in this, oh, it's a pristine, as a prestigious project because it's been validated by getting into a certain festival. So that's where all the sales agents go to see what's available and then they pick up whatever they like. And basically they'll be looking for commercial projects, a lot of them, to be honest with you. If they'll, they will buy, they will pick up the project um, with, they'll already have, they'll already know where they're going to target it. For example, I've seen this, we're on it, 
like my, my last app, Father of the Cyborgs, it's, it does fit into kind of some of the Netflix kind of um, type of vibe, sci-fi type vibe where you're downloading brains. There seems to be a lot into the brain, you know, sci-fi type development. So that's 100% why we have a sales agent in New York who picked it up. 100% their aim was, we're going we're to take this up and we're going to pitch it to Netflix. That was 100% their aim. And they're going to get whatever, if they sell it for X amount, they're going to take 20% and they'll be delighted with themselves. Great day's work done. You know, th th that's why they picked it up. Now, as it, as it turns out, Netflix said no to it. So, and a few others outlets have said no to it as well. But it's with Vice Media at the moment. So that's where we're hoping it'll sell. So I should, should know within a few weeks if, if they sell it or not. Um, and Vice, what they'll do is, or any of these type of Netflix, what they'll do is they'll actually buy the worldwide rights. So RT give a bit of money for, for this stock. So basically RT have the Irish rights. And then a big outlet like this day was by worldwide in perpetuity. They'll own it, own it for 20 years. And they'll give you your money and you walk away. And that's how it works. And that's one of the best ways of making money in docs. Another way is, again, you're, you have your sales agent. And they can sell it territory by territory. So they can sell it to PBS in America. Basically, America is up where the big sales are. Everyone wants to get big sales to HBO because they have lots of money. Um, but then if you could be selling it to... Latvia, you might only get two grand, you know what I mean, for your doc files. You might get 200 grand in, in um, America. One interesting thing as well, seems this last thing on money because it's boring, but when you get funding from Screen Ireland or something like that, it's, it's deemed, it's not deemed funding or a grant, it's deemed a production loan. So for example, if a funder puts in 100,000 grant, 100,000 into the project, you've, they've got to get their money back before you, 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 you get your share. So keep that in mind as well. It, there's, you know, it's never simple. So just hope that kind of goes some ways to answering what what what, what you asked. David, uh, yeah, just a small thing to, uh, and again, this is just a kind of a ground up question. But in, in like like you know, what say Jody um, has has an idea there uh, about some uh, uh, up and up and coming kickboxer from Mayo or something like that, and she wants to make a documentary about that. How, like you talk about uh, like. Like, what does the production company bring to the table for, for, for Jody? Like, what do they do? The different roles. Say, Jody is a, a, a good camera person. She has a story idea. She's a kind of a good all rounder. Um, you know, like, Jody's a director. Uh, you know, what, what does a producer do and what does a production company do? Could you just answer, answer that? Yeah, sure. Um, well, essentially, they make sure that, that a production company is the right production company for you. You know what I mean? That again, if they're if they've only done kind of lifestyle shows, you know, renovating houses and stuff, they may be the wrong company. So first of all, research the right company that you think of a track record and maybe developing projects about characters, you know, individuals and stuff like that. That would be my first point of call, finding the right production company. Then what the production company would do is then you have access to all their basically, all their, their, their network, for example. You have access, first of all, they'll have experience pitching projects. So they'll know exactly what to put in your pitch because you, you essentially you, you'll only have Maybe in the at the outset, you'll only be sending a one pager in, so they will be able to really you know distill the story down onto one page, make sure that it's razor sharp for commissioning the editor. Then you'll have access, like I said, to their camera people, all their network of talent that they can actually bring to make sure that you know that side of the project is looked after. That you have a really good production crew involved, and then they'll be able to take it to like, essentially what the producer does is get the money. That's essentially the producer's job is to get funding for it. That's what they're there for. So they will then pitch it to the right commissioning editor. They'll, again, for example, maybe a project that you mentioned could be eligible for BAI as well. So you could go to RT and you could say, well, is it, are you interested in commissioning this straight off, which is great. Or they, they might say, well, we're actually we're a bit tight, you know, it's the end of the year, we're a little bit tight, but maybe we might put it in for BAI round down the line. Don't forget that maybe, why not? Again, there's loads of options open. Why not make a short documentary out of it? It may, maybe maybe it warrants more. I don't know, but you know what I mean. It, it maybe is it, there is a short talk in it. I don't know, um, but they, they, they'd be the options really. But the, the the main reason you'd be going to the production company is to make sure to use their experience and make sure they get the bloody thing funded. They get money. That's what the producer's goal is. And so, if she, if she is a camera person, it would help. Like I said, if she has filmed some of this stuff already. That would really what you don't want to do is like I said, is end up being pushed out of your own project. It it, it happens. So so Jody has a kind of a rough cut of some of what she's talking about making it on, and maybe it's not 
Um, it doesn't have the kind of Netflix level production values that they would. Oh, just, okay, Joe, really, let's uh, at this point, what I do is very quickly. Yeah, so I was at the point where, where she was at, at, well, at, at, you know, maybe 12 years ago. I had an idea. It was the, the Ross Talton idea that Fergie mentioned at the top. So essentially, what it was is it's a story of a cycling race. So basically, the first thing, if you pitch that to a production, a production company, or if you pitch it to a commissioner, they say, who cares? They're not interested in a cycling race. It's, then Irish National Cycling Race, no one gives a damn. But where people got interested in it, in, it wasn't just sports. I always, one of the little nice little rules I have is you don't tell one story, you tell two. So it's the story of a cycling race, but it was actually founded by one of the leaders of the IRA. And he, he, was, this, he was a lunatic. He was like Joe Crystal, his name was. And he was involved with, uh, I think he was actually, people say he, was, he blew up Nelson's Pillar in Dublin. So he's this really militant Republican in the 60s and what he, he in the 50s, in fact, and what he wanted to do was start his own version of the Tour de France in Ireland to promote his own Republican aims. That's a loose idea. And then they sent people off to the Olympic Games in Australia to try and put out the Olympic flame. So there's all this kind of mad little kind of cap stories that they're protesting. They also, two days after the Black September attack in um, the Munich Olympics, they had their own protest. Like the timing was atrocious. You know what I mean? It was the, they infiltrated the Olympic sighting race and had their own protests again. So it has all these kind of madcap stories. So, so now you've got sports and you've got politics, and then it's really appealing because it's a social story. It's not just about a sighting race. So that's why so I pitched that to RT and they really liked it, really liked it, really liked it. I got a company in Galway involved that hadn't been commissioned by RT, but they had made a lot of strategic error. And I, we fell at the very last hurdle. And I think the reason... We fell at the last hurdle was because the production company didn't have experience with RT at the time. So we subsequently went to RT, went to TG Car, TG Car picked it up, and we went through the BEI route. The BEI gave us money straight away, and that won, there's kind of a Celtic media prize. It's basically all the Celtic nations, you know, the stuff from BBC Scotland, Wales, some bit of France and Ireland, and won the over prize at that. So that kind of helped me, you know, kind of, okay, well, these guys kind of know what, what they're doing. So that's kind of, that's how I first got my break. So I was look, I mean, I pitched myself initially to RT, which was probably in hindsight the wrong thing to do. It was trial and error, trust me, all the way. Um, and we were, we were really looking to get it over the line in TG Carrow as well. It was a summon from us, the commissioning editor in, in the canteen. Like that, that's how, it was, you know, there's a very fine line between, you know, getting your doc made and just the abyss. But that, that's how I got my first break. Um, what were, you, what were you saying there before that? There, there was a reason why I went into that rant, but I can't remember now. Um, you're on mute, Virgil. You're on mute, Virgil, if you can't hear me. Sorry, uh, sorry, David. Uh, yeah, I, I think I'd just asked you about the interaction between, like, you know, what the line between a producer and a director and the production company, you know, where, uh, where the lines between them are, you know, and where, uh, where they're blurred, because um i suppose a lot of uh, a, a lot of the guys in the room here would be kind of good good all-rounders you know in, in terms of like they could they can they can shoot they can tell stories um but they wouldn't necessarily have the the the, the, the specialist um knowledge yeah, that you might well, need. You, you, i know i know what the point was now um you mentioned the, the person the mayor well, who's, who can fill them and you mentioned the production levels that it has to be at. i'm going to show you the one for the spoil of the cyborgs if you, i'll just get you, get you a number of clip further now, what I did, I did this, when you apply to the development funding in Screen Ireland is really, really good. It's something that I'd really recommend as well, because what it means is um, the funders themselves, they're not going to give someone off the bat 100,000 euros or whatever, or, you know, 200,000 euros, but here you go, see you in the year. What they, they, they do initially is they give you development funding of around between 10 and 15,000 euros, and you use that to make what Fergal actually mentioned, you make, to make a little teaser clip to actually show that you can then subsequently show the broadcasters this is a project. Now, the standard would be really, really high in these. Like, you, you know, when, when, you're, when you're given the development funding to make a trailer, it has to be almost as good as something that you see in a cinema. That's the, the level that it's at. Now, the interesting thing as well about getting funding, there's when you have these little teaser clips, film festivals, there's a few, they have pitching competitions. And essentially what we did, for pretty much all my projects, not the Ross Salton one, but the other projects, because they were deemed kind of slightly bigger. We were looking for international funding as well. Um, we, 
just a Sheffield Dock Fest in England, and there's like just there's ITFA in Amsterdam, and there's Hot Docs in Canada. They they have what they call pitching forums. So they basically maybe five or six hundred new projects in development. They all apply to these pitching forums, and what happens is they pick the best sixty. So we were picked. The last two projects I did were picked for the one in Sheffield. So our, automatically it kind of elevates your project even before, it, even though it's in pre-production, you haven't shot a proper frame yet. You've already, you can, you can come back to funders for production funding and say, well, we actually got selected for this pitching forum. So it, look, it basically means that someone else thinks it's good. And the way these pitching forums work is we, once, once you get selected in the 60, the festivals, they, they arrange meetings for you. So these meetings could be with sales agents. They could be more importantly with people who are going to actually back your project. And that, that's really what you're there for to get funding. So you meet all the commissioning editors from all over Europe, all over America, are all at these meetings, and they're all looking for uh, projects. So that's when, when you want to get into them as well, you basically get a direct one on one meeting with, with the people you really need to be in the room with. So that would be another way, a really useful way of, um, again, elevating yourself if, say, maybe you haven't got commissioned, but if you can make a teaser, a really tasty teaser and get into one of these pitching competitions, you really, you, you, you will probably get commissioned, I think. Um, so there's the Sheffield, the Sheffield Meat Market, that's what it's called. Um, it, it, there's Sheffield Dock Fest, but the Meat Market is the Pacific area that I'm talking about now. And um, it, uh, that's one in Amsterdam in November, and there's Hot Docs, which is in Canada. So the Meat Market in Sheffield is probably more holistic on the target because it's easy to get to Sheffield. So I'm gonna get for, I'll get you to play two clips for it because I'm talking a lot, I'm not showing anything. That's the Ross one, we won't show that one because um, what I'll do, actually show crash, uh, clip number three, Fergal. So this is um, the clip, no, not clip three, sorry. Uh, uh, crash and Burn trailer two, clip two. Yeah, that's the one. driver who I think has got a great motor racing future in front of him. And there is the man to watch, Tommy Byrne from Dundalk in Ireland. When I was racing, I didn't think I was the best driver in the world. I knew I was the best driver in the world. I didn't fear any driver. You have to have self-belief, but you have to back it up. Vettel Schumacher, Ayrton Senna. You can use those names when you talk about Tommy as a special talent. We expected Tommy Byrne to be in Formula One for a long time and successful in Formula One too. Ayrton Senna and Tommy Byrne were the two greatest drivers of our generation. A completely different set of circumstances. Young racing drivers normally have access to money and backing. Tommy had none of that. I was most of that time fighting for my job and fighting for my career. I had to win to get the next race. There is the winner, Tommy Byrne. He's definitely in a class of his own. He was an amazing driver because he had sheer natural talent. But his lifestyle was very crazy, very mixed up. You never, ever knew where he was going to be. The myth that Formula One sells is that the cream always rises to the top. Tommy debunks that. Nobody as good as Tommy's never not good. There's only Tommy. Speed alone is not enough to get to the top where there's sponsors, where there's major manufacturers involved. And they don't want people. They're a little bit wild like that. They're, they're nervous. I got fucked over in when I did drive Formula One with Theodore by the manager because he didn't believe in my talent. Yeah, then obviously the drinking and you know the, the drugs got a little bit more and I did some serious partying and I was still racing. I mean, I, I won a bunch of races on over in America. There are so many questions left unanswered. I'm not saying that the sport just killed Tommy Byrne. I don't think they overhelped him but I'm not sure he helped himself. Who gave who up? Why? That's the question that haunts me. I think I just got beat down. I never did have a fallback. I never had a plan B. Hasn't been a terrible life. I just lost out on about a hundred million dollars. That's all. From poverty all the way to F1 in four and a half years, on nothing more than talent. We may never see a similar story again. So there's a few points I want to make about that clip. Um, 
So I we had just finished the Ross Talton, and it had won a few prizes that I mentioned. So we went into uh, the Film Ireland, uh, Screen Ireland rather, for, for development funding. And again, we were, I still wasn't that established, to be honest with you. You know, I mean, I was well, well down the ladder at this point. But we figured we'd roll the dice and look for development funding. I figured it had a good enough chance. We weren't looking for a huge amount of money. It's only, you know, I think it was 12,000 euros to get us. And with, with that money, we flew Tommy, Tommy, the main guy in that dock, we flew him over from America, where he's based now, put, the, put together the trailer, and then we submitted it into the Sheffield meat market that I, that I mentioned. And I remember we had a discussion with the with the project manager at the time in Screen Ireland, but we were just shooting shoot breeze with him and saying, okay, lads, one of the things you need to get funding as well is you need to actually, one of the boxes that you need to, because you need to kind of outline your plan like that. You're not, and you're not just going to make a trailer and then just sit on it. Like how you actually, do you have a plan to see the project to, to until the end, I guess? And he asked us what our plans were. And we said, oh, we're hoping to get into Sheffield Meat Market. And he was like, good luck with that, lads. Kind of like as if you know really hope. And he probably, he was probably being honest. Like he wasn't just being pragmatic, right? You know, um, there's a lot of the, the topics that they pick like I said, it could be 600 entered, that's the usual number, to pick 60. A lot of them are kind of whatever is topical at the moment, you know what I mean? Whatever, you know, the five main things that are topical, they generally make up the majority of the projects that are picked. So we, we, got, we, we got picked for the meat market, but trust me, we were like last in the door or second last in the door. And that's again what I mean, very fine margins. So at that point, we had one of the, when you have meetings with the commissioning editors, they're going to ask, one of the things that they ask you for, so I mentioned, do you have a good idea? Uh, who's involved? What have you done? And one of the other question, important questions they're going to ask next is how much money do you have involved? How much money on board do you have already? And so we mentioned that we we got development funding from Screen Ireland, and we were confident that we'd have money from you know, that they were going to follow through with, with production funding. And we also mentioned that because it was an Irish story, RT you were interested in, in in it as well. So we had to. Fairly strong, con- you know, fairly, we were pretty confident that we'd get money from Screen Ireland and RTE. So we nearly had the funding together anyway. And then, again, fine margins. We, had, we only got funding from one person at the, at that, in, in the meeting itself. But it was, we were lucky. We got put in, one of our meetings was with one of the main people from BBC. And he literally, like people, they're, the conversations can go on for months after Sheffield to get funding, you know, and actually lock down the contract. We got an email that morning, he CCB and BBC Northern Ireland, and it was done. BBC Northern Ireland were involved. So we, we were elected, and, and we, we got some interest from, from some sales agents as well. So we subsequently went back to Screen Ireland. We said we have RTE involved, we have BBC Northern, Northern Ireland involved, we have all these sales agents involved, which means, you know, they have a commer- it may have a commercial life afterwards, and they give us funding for it. And that's how, how how we got that one off the ground. David, what was the what was the original idea? What was the original pitch? Now we, the lads would have got a sense of it off the trailer, but it, you walked in a room. You're like, what, what's your one line, two story pitch for the Tommy Byrne one? Tommy, I can I can actually just remember exactly what I said to BBC uh, guy. I said I basically researched other motor racing programs that they had on BBC4. And I said, listen, you've got, you showed in the last year, you showed X, Y, and Z motor racing programs. If you want something that appeals to the same audience, this is it. That's exactly what I said to him. Also, what I should mention as well is we totally hung on to the, the coattails of the Senna documentary that had been out a couple of years ago. We completely used that because one of the things you've asked as well, is there a precedent for a similar, where's your audience? Who's going to watch this? If the Senna documentary hadn't come out, this documentary would have been a completely harder sell. But the Senate doc proved that there was an audience for a similar project. So that really got us over the line as well. I think maybe it would have got, maybe it would have got met anyway, but it, would, it was a much easier sell with the Senate doc. There was also a less successful doc called Road. I think there, 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 the, there's a family in Northern Ireland called the Dunlops. They're big into motorbikes. And that was a very successful documentary as well, because basically they've got anyone who's into motor racing, motorbikes, they're really hardcore, really obsessive about it. So everyone that was into it watched the documentary. So it was really successful within a certain group. So both those documentaries really helped us, um, I, I think, as well. You, again, showing that there's an audience, there was a potential for it. So, so David, like, that was kind of the executive pitch, um, as in the, the, the money man pitch. Um, you know, we've got something that would appeal to your audience. But like, what was the... The story pitch in terms of like, you know, what's what's your sense of what the core of that story is? 
that makes it interesting. I think this again with Senna link, I think we had these lines better than Senna. That was essentially the kind of a kind of a lost talent, the underdog. You know what I mean? Who is this guy? That that was the thing that intrigued me. Like, how is this guy from Dundalk as good as as good as Ert and Senna? Like he was a legend in the sport. And how the hell has no one heard about him? And then you kind of get all these you know stories. There's lots of debauched stories of Tommy, so it kind of was, it was entertaining as much as anything else, you know. So kind of ticked all those boxes. But again, the Senna thing was really helpful and we we, we sold the lands on the Senna. I think even in the first paragraph of the page two was Eddie Jordan says he's, he was better than Senna and Mike you Mark, you know, so it was we really just played on that, I think. That kind of relates a bit to, there's a, another question in there from Adam um, that he, he, he said, it's like when, when, you know, when you're coming to a project, um, which do you look at first? Is it telling a story that the audience doesn't know about it? Doesn't know about or contributing new threads to a conversation around that topic? Um, like which is more important when you're pitching and planning? So I suppose is it an original story versus adding to like a conversation that's already happening? You know, it can be either. I mean, for me, the the, the docs I seem to work on are all kind of secret stories that no one knows about. But that's not it's not a conscious decision. It's just I don't know, maybe down the line, I've only made three. I'm working, I'm working on, funnily enough, I'm working on two ones at the moment and they're both last stories as well. So maybe you know, there is this definite thread amongst all the stories, but I, I don't, it must be subconscious because it's not, I don't consciously go looking for them. They just happen to be the stories that I'm interested in. You know, I think um, if you, for example, this year's sports stars, there's going to be documentaries made on them for Christmas probably. But the way I look at it is someone's already doing that stuff. It's kind of, I don't know, it just doesn't get me excited, to be honest with you. I mean, there's so much other cool stuff um, out there. It's probably even more interesting, you know. So that's just what interests me. You know what I mean? Other people have different interests. I, I don't specifically go looking for a type of story. If there was a story that, that there was already, it's, you know, part of a bigger conversation already, and I was interested in it, sure, no problem at all. But it, I just go with whatever gets me excited, to be honest. And with you. And those ideas, uh, David, where did you come across the Tommy story originally? Where did you come across the father of the cyborg story originally? You know, where was the... the, the yeah, where I, I just, I'm always, keep, I mean, if you think about it logically, you only really need one good idea a year, which isn't that much, you know what I mean? So I, can, I think it's a case of, like, I mean, every, everyone here listening to this has about 10 ideas for documentary already. I just, you just do, you know, 10 ideas for articles, you're involved in journalism. That's not even open for debate. So I think it's a case of, the way I look at it is too many ideas are as bad as too little, because if you have too many ideas, you're not focused and you really need to, you know, you really need to focus on one or two ideas and work on them. But the, where the paradox here is that if you have, you know, I think to generate one or two killer ideas, you need to come up with lots of ideas. So I'm always just basically keeping my ear to the ground. And that's how I kind of come across stories, you know, so, and a lot of them, the majority of them are terrible that, you know, should never see the light of day. So it, it's really, it's, it's, it's about picking your battles, I think, as well. Is the story that gets you really excited, do you think it has a runner? Do you think you can actually get it made, that you're not just, you know, throwing mud against the wall and none of it's sticking? So picking your battles is, I think, the most important, one of the most important things that I'm working in. I'm working with a German company at the moment, that their Beats Brothers are called, they're really big producers in Europe. They're one of the, probably the biggest production company for documentaries in Europe with a new doc. And like I was talking to the main guy, I was over there with them about a month ago. And he says like every project that we go at has to happen because we're investing time in it, in it you know. So that you know, if you are, I mean, I put the project that I'm talking about at the moment, like I put probably in a dip, you now dipping in and out. I've been dipping in and out of it for two years. So I mean, you wouldn't find that it's probably two months of work gone into it inadvertently. So you really, you know, you lot, and and I haven't been paid for it yet. So you really have to make sure that um that it's, it's going to happen, you know, now I'm confident enough this one will happen, but you know what I mean, it's not guaranteed yet. And again, we spoke about kind of handing your ideas over to other, you know, coming to another company, so another company with your ideas. So I have to be kind of, I'm not worried about them. I mean, that they're, they seem they're completely legit and everything, but it's, you know, you just, you have to be careful that you don't, you're not sidelined out. The interesting thing with getting the last stock into Tribeca as well is that it's opened all these doors. I mean, there was no conversation about the what you've done question is totally answered. And the main dude in Beats Brothers, he was able to go to channels in Germany and France. And when they asked, what has what this guy David Burke done? Well, he did this in Tribeca. That was okay. Next question. Um, and the interesting thing about timing as well is quite key. 
the the project that I'm discussing with them at the moment is um, it's based in Chile, but the 50th anniversary of the Chilean coup is in September 2023. So if you have an anniversary that you can hook your project on, basically why now is one of the questions commissioning editors ask as well. Why why are we making this now? Why not five years time? You know what I mean? If you can give them a hook, an anniversary, or something like that, it, so it it really you know it's one of these questions that you need to have to, to think about as well. You've seen yourself all of the the anniversary programs for you know the Easter Rising and stuff. There's always that was the hook. They obviously had to ha happen then, you know. So that's something that you need to be mindful of as well. Um, so that was Crash and Burn. So Crash and Burn, then like I said, we 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 got the funding to make it. And one of the things you need to validate a project is getting it into a film festival, a fairly decent one. And we, we, we did okay. I mean, it got into the Sheffield Doc Fest again, which is, it's not canned, it's far from canned, but it's actually, it's not as, when I first heard Sheffield, I was like, meh, Sheffield, sure, how big can that be? But it's actually one of the bigger doc festivals in Europe. It's pr probably one of the, I think it's ITFA in Amsterdam and Sheffield are the two big doc documentary festivals in, in Europe. So if you get into it again, it just kind of validates your project. You just you can kind of get the, the laurels on your poster and stuff like that. It, it, it basically tells me, specifically it's been Ireland, okay, we, we've actually, we've done our job well. You know, we, we were actually, we were able to get it into a decent level festival and, you know, we, we've justified, we, we, we've backed up what we said with Substance at the start. So getting into the festival is useful for things like that, I think, it, and it does help you going forward as well. It was also on RTE and... Or to show a kind of a shorter version, not, not the future version, so he could whatever fit into one of the slots. That, that was fine. To, to be totally honest with you, I would say the feature version was 80 minutes, and we cut off um, probably 25 minutes for the RT version. And the 25 minutes that we cut off were not missed at all, to be honest with you. There was a little bit of slack in it, I guess, being be totally honest. And what I did then is with that doc, so there's these if, if there words, you know, whatever, taking a pinch of salt. But again, it's just trying to. It's all about building momentum for the next project. So being honest, there is the ITFA Film Awards and there's the ITFA TV Awards. And I knew we had no hope in hell in winning the ITFA, take, putting it into the Film Awards and going for the feature doc. I just knew there was a doc called 66 Days by um, Bobby Sands a couple of years ago. It would have been up against that, which coincidentally, yeah, subsequently didn't win anyway. But I figured that was going to win. So I figured we had no hope winning. So what I did is I put it into the TV Awards and said, into the TV category. And we, we, I knew we had a great chance in that and I won it. So again, that kind of built momentum for the next one, you know, and um, that's kind of what it's all about. So the next one then was for the cyborgs. And I did actually what I do is I'll show you we were on about we were on about clips about that you can kind of film yourself. Um, you know, just to kind of show people where the project is at at a very early stage. And it, the reason I, I actually wanted this clip to show you this clip was, was because it's really dog rough. It's super, super, super rough. It's like, I wouldn't, you know, I definitely wouldn't show it publicly normally, but it's just impressive on me, like, you know, what, what, it doesn't have to be perfect at the start, basically, you know, don't worry too much about that. Um, the, the importance of showing you this clip as well is it helped in two ways. Now, I was looking for development funding at the time. This isn't one like I would have taken to broadcasters for production funding, just may make that difference. But the interesting thing, this clip proved two things when I was looking for development funding from Screen Ireland. First and foremost, it showed uh, they showed that I'd actually accessed Phil Kennedy, that I wasn't just making this crazy story up about this neuroscientist, that I'd actually met the guy, that we'd sat down, we had a chat. Secondly, what it showed to one of the people from Screen Ireland subsequently said to me was that he's no he's nothing like what we we, we expected. If we had you know, read this, read about him just on paper, we would have had a totally different idea of what it was about. So really helped in that regard. A final thing I'll say about this clip is, like I said, it's dog rough, super rough, and I most of the clips, the footage that's in it, to dress the interview up, I just robbed off the internet, all downloaded off YouTube. So don't be afraid to do that as well. I mentioned that the the the, the, the Senate documentary that, that I mentioned a while back. That's how the Senate documentary started. Uh, they literally pulled clips off the internet. They got twenty all of YouTube, the majority of it. It was they basically made a twenty-minute short film of what they project, what they envisioned it to be. All clips off internet, 20 minutes, put it together, and that's what they subsequently pitched to get it, to get it made. So Just to be clear here, we're not advocating copyright theft. 
No, well, it won't, it won't be, um, it won't be, it's not, not shown publicly and all, all fair usage, if in the highly unlikely event it is. Thank but, you. Uh, it, it, it's, it's important just to. <laughs> but, um, but, that, that, but like I said, these projects aren't being, okay, yeah. But um, that, that's how these projects happen anyway. And I may, and, and of course, I copy, I copyright all the footage that I use here. So for a little bit, it, this is clip number four for you. Every year, hundreds of thousands of Americans suffer strokes, injuries, or diseases that leave them unable to move or speak. Well, now there is an experimental brain implant that could one day enable them to communicate again with a computer controlled by thought. Now, it sounds incredible, but it's already being tested in one patient. We are lucky enough to have its inventor, Dr. Philip Kennedy, joining us this morning from Atlanta. This sounds like something out of Star Trek. The science fiction is only just a matter of time. Every decade or every generation is more science fiction that becomes fact. The scientific milestone in this area came in the 1960s when Dr. Jose Delgado demonstrated remote control over a charging bull. He stood in front of the bull who was charging, pressed the button, stimulated the bull, or just didn't pass out, he just, just relaxed. Very dramatic as it showed that moment, well, you know, you're right. Our ultimate goal is the continuation of evolution of the human species. I went to Belize to partly to keep the project going and in a different direction. The reaction from the scientific community was very good. And people withheld judgment when they didn't know all the details. They didn't go spouting off about you shouldn't do that. I did present to the group of neurosurgeons at their annual meeting, and uh, some of them were not too enthusiastic about it. It's my brain, not yours, don't worry about it. Uh, Elon Musk's project, he wants to augment our brains, which has been my aim for a long time, and augment our brains so that we're more, we're more powerful brains. If he succeeds in getting this done, we are at a tipping point. It could evolve in what you call a bad or um, unethical and um, deleterious to the human race. I think we will evolve um, intellectually, but more important is emotionally. We just start fighting with each other. And the more technology you have, the more dangerous it is if you are not emotionally stable and can't make peace with each other. I think we're going to evolve into either brains in a jar or in a machine or totally artificial intelligence robot. Now, I know that frightens most people. Too bad, but that's the way it's going to happen as far as I can see. Um, so, yeah. So that's that was we we pitched that then at the Sheffield Meat Market, and actually I think this is a much better the documentary itself is a much stronger doc than the Brazen Car Driver. It's uh, just we, it's, a, it's a level above it. Um, but funnily enough, we actually didn't get funding in um, Sheffield for it. We, we pitched at it. We had about seven sales agents that were interested in it. They all wanted to you know, represent it when it was made. But interestingly enough, no one actually came on board at the time uh, to fund this. Like we had, we were confident Screen Ireland would come in, and RTE were going to come in as well. We knew that, but we still had a missing piece of the jigsaw. And the reason I mentioned the sales agent being interested in that when we did subsequently apply for funding from Screen Ireland, well, I had all these letters of interest from seven sales agents. So it really showed that there is at least there is interest to get this thing out there when it's made. Uh, how I actually ended up getting this one for finish was I just literally googled one day science film funding something something along that line 
and I found this Sloan Foundation in the States. They fund a lot of prime programs for, uh, on PBS in the States. They're big, 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 big fund. They, fund, they also fund a lot of research, uh, but they also fund projects that promote science as well. And that's how I got to find a piece of the jigsaw. They came in with a lot of money, you know what I mean? But now it was a slow process. You send them a one pager and then they look for more information and they look for more information. That's how I got it over the line, just by through stubbornness as much as anything else, you know. But if we really needed that extra piece of the jigsaw, we would have been struggling. We could have met it, but it would have been compromised, I think. And so with this, and then I mentioned, so the doc is finished then, or it was early last year. We were lucky we just got in under the, the bar as it was regards COVID. We literally got back. We got back March the 13th from our last shoot, which was the day the country closed. So we were lucky we were able to kind of keep going editing all last year, really. So the doc was finished at the end of last year. We were submitting it to kind of festivals like Sundance and Berlin. And I had notions about getting into some of them, but no, fell short. And again, a lot of the festivals pick stuff that's topical. Um, and I mean, it's really difficult. Like, I mean, there's thousands of people like you know, Sundance could get 15,000 people. Like that's like the Olympics of documentaries. That's where everyone wants to be and everyone says they're, they're the aim for it but very very uh, very difficult to get in and so i, I put it initially into I, I said it was festivals are kind of precious about status so basically the world premier status if you can bring that to a festival you'd have more you'd be more likely to get into it so basically everyone would hold on to the world premier status for for some nights they wouldn't give it to a smaller festival beforehand because you really just disqualified yourself from getting into one of the bigger festivals then so we still haven't got it i I wasn't too surprised we didn't get into the Sundance, but I was kind of, you know, I thought we might have a chance. But I think it was, in hindsight, it was probably in oceans. But um, I put it into the Dublin Film Festival, and they were really enthusiastic about it. And what I did, well, what I said was that it's not the world premiere. I said that it's kind of a preview screening or something like that. So it, it basically, it got took the pressure off me a little bit that, you know, at least it was in the festival now, it was out in the world. And I still had held on to the world premiere status. And we were lucky enough then, I was kind of beginning to scratch my head, like, Christ, where is this going to get in? And then we got into Tribeca, which is like, there's the big one. There's seven big film festivals in the world. Tribeca is one of them. So we were just, again, look at the draw. You know what I mean? It just suited their sensibilities, you know? And that's how it got in. It wasn't that it was better or worse or anything like that. So it, it's a funny one. You know what I mean? You kind of scratch. I thought maybe South by Southwest would have been a more suitable film festival for us, kind of edgy or hipster type vibe. They have a tech side to their festival as well. So that was one I thought we really were kind of going gung ho for. So when it didn't get into that, I was like, crikey, could be a bit of trouble here. But luckily, I think in hindsight, Tribeca was probably makes more sense for it, though, to be honest with you. But that changed everything. Now it's in festivals all around the, all, all around the world because you, once you get into one of the big ones, you, you get invitations for loads of different other festivals as well. So again, when the project is finished, there are certain boxes that you need to tick as well. So what festivals did you get into? What sales agent do you have? Um, has it sold? You know what I mean? So there are questions people would ask down the line. Um, so like I said, Tribeca was a game changer because then with the new project, it's kind of elevated me up again. What have you done? He's been in Tribeca. Okay, he's, he's in whatever. That, 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 that lead, not going in my trumpet, but that's just kind of how... Um, lads, uh, uh, David, I'm... I, I'm conscious of time at the moment. Um, oh. Yeah, I've already done anyway, so... Yeah, uh, did, did, did anyone want to come in with any questions? Um, I, I did, did, did see one there that I hadn't gotten to um, in terms of uh, uh, shooting uh, these kind of talking heads, uh, sound bites. Uh, you know, when you've got sen sensitive interviewees, the likes of um, Tommy Byrne or maybe Phil Kennedy or, or, or various people, or they're speaking about difficult topics, um, you know, where are good places to shoot them that they will um, reveal um, more about themselves? I think shoot, normally, I think it's even useful in general. I, I've read something before that if you shoot someone in their own house or shoot someone in their own kitchen, people associate more with it. It seems more natural, I think. And people, audience actually connect more when, when interviews are conducted in them areas. So that's where I would kind of be leaning yourself towards. It makes sense as well. If you're taking a complete stranger that you've met maybe once or twice and you're picking into a big dark studio, it's not as, you know, conducive to like an open chat. So I think if you can do it in their own home, something like that, that would be plan A. Not everyone wants to be interviewed in their own home, of course, but plan A would be somewhere that they're comfortable. Make sure it is, it maybe at least you're going, for sound, you're going to need somewhere quiet anyway, but plan A at their home or maybe their workplace or their office or somewhere that they're 
you know that they're they're not going to be worried or somewhere that they're familiar with, I guess. Great. OK, yeah, thanks for that. Uh, I was assuming that answers a question for you, Adam. Um, is there anyone else that wants to come in um, at, at the moment? Anybody um, with any questions? Um, a bit quiet at the moment. Um, anyone would just give give a minute. Uh, but uh, so you you're kind of unusual in that like sport and kind of more news or feature oriented stuff interests you. Like a, a lot of people are kind of one one or or, or the other. Do you, do you have a preference, David, or is it just the character regardless of the setting? Yeah, it's, the setting is kind of irrelevant, really. To be honest with you, I mean, I have absolutely no interest in motor racing whatsoever. Still don't have any interest in wood racing. It just happens that Tommy Byrne was a lunatic who happened to drive a car. And th that's what was interesting, you know. He could have been a hockey player, he could have been whatever, you know, the rugby player, but um, a boxer or whatever. No, I, it, it just the setting is kind of irrelevant, really. To them. Now I wouldn't say irrelevant because it does colour it, of course. Um, but like, for example, Tommy Byrne was kind of a poor kid in a rich man's sport. So that, that was kind of, you know, that's where the sport came in there. But it wasn't, it's not a motor racing doc per se. You don't have to be into, you, you definitely don't have to be into motor racing to watch that. In say, insofar as you don't have to be into neuroscience to, to watch Father the Cyber, it's just he just happens to be a neuroscientist, you know. So it's the character really, and I think uh, I think that's what people connect with really is the character rather than the setting. I mean, otherwise, you, if you take a really staid science documentary, for example, they're more like glorified PowerPoint presentations. Really, it's just fact. There's no real, there's no, there's nothing, there's no personal story to hang the meat on, you know. Is there, and again, it's another uh, question from Adam. You're keeping us going with questions today. Yeah, Adam. <laughs> the, uh, just is there a story uh, that you'd love to tell but feel it's impossible to tackle for whatever reason? Um, like, is there, a, is, is there a long held, uh, your, your Napoleon, uh, Kubrick's Napoleon, the diva version of that a story that you'd yeah, like to tell? I actually, I think I have the trailer there. Immediately, just when we finished um, Crash and Burn, I think. I submitted to Swing Ireland for more development funding. And I probably, in hindsight, I should have kept my powder dry a little bit, waited till the doc got into a festival. It wasn't in any festival at the time, but I was still, from where I was, where, from where I, I was thinking was, I mean, I was trying to get another project up and going rather than sitting around, you know? So I think I would have been better if I hung off, waited till the doc got into Sheffield, and then I, might, I would have had a little bit more kudos behind me. Um, it's a story about, it's a, oh, it's, he's great. He's a guy called Damien Enright. He's actually a nature writer for um, the, the Examiner. And, but he's got this mad backstory that people don't know about. He wrote this great biography called Dope in the Age of Innocence. So he, he went to Ibiza in 1958 when there was no one else there. There was nothing going on. There was, wasn't even an airport. Ibiza was completely cut off. It was completely different from, where, where, from what it is now. The island had been ostracized by Franco. So basically about 20 of the biggest lunatics in Europe ended up there um, before any of the beat happened. And it's basically about, it's about the counterculture movement, the beginning of the European counterculture movement and how basically it all went sour very quickly. Enright himself, he drove, he almost, he drove to Turkey to pick up hash for the group. He was kind of really idealistic. When he, when he was driving back, he got busted in Spain. So he ended up, it was the biggest drugs bust ever in Spain at the time. So, so he ended up going on the run. And so he's, he's a brilliant writer. He went to Ibiza initially to be a writer. And he, he subsequently wrote a screenplay, actually, of this film in the, of this in the 70s. And it was optioned. So he was getting hanging out with all these big movie stars in Hollywood. They were going to make this film. But he said that he wouldn't, he wouldn't option. They, they wanted it to be in his name. And he knew Kitty's parents to have his name associated with the story. So he actually just dropped it. So he's, he's great. So he's... Um, so that, that, that's, that was an idea I thought was really great. RTE liked it, but for some reason I just couldn't get it over the line. I don't know why. I still think it's brilliant. And subsequently, the company that have met Lupin uh, and that's on Netflix at the moment, they have actually optioned this story to make it into a four-part series. Now, I don't know if it'll happen or not, but so, you know, someone else thinks it's good as well, but it's a crack of story. He's brilliant. He's a great way of articulating himself. So maybe the lesson to, from that is maybe just make sure when you are submitting it, have a little bit of wind in your sails. I don't, I don't know. Maybe they just thought it was crap. Funnily enough, if I didn't make it, I wouldn't have made Father of the Cyborgs and I probably wouldn't have got into Tribeca. So maybe they were right after all, you know? I don't know. 
Great. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's I'd have, I'd have a whip around to to to, to see that one, uh, David. Uh, it's it, it sounds great. So, um, right. So, look, I think um, if we've, do we have any other final questions there? Uh, there's a few of you in the. Uh, it, it, I don't see uh, any final questions before we wrap up. Um, I, anyone want to come in on audio or anything like that? No, they're all very quiet. It doesn't mean that they're not listening. I, I, I get this all the time, uh, <laughs> David, but they're, they're there anyway. Um, and uh, no, look, I, I, I think that, that that just about wraps it up for, for now. David, uh, thank you so much for your time. Um, so my pleasure. Thanks a lot. Thanks for you all for coming, for coming along. Really interesting topics. Um, and those movies are out now um, <laughs> at a cinema near you. Uh, definitely that Paul and Cyborg's one is, is, is great. Uh, uh, so, so go check it out if you can. And Crash and Burn is on. Uh, you can pay for it. Don't illegally download it. <laughs> is it on Amazon Prime, David? <laughs> it's on, I think if you have a Prime account, you can watch it for free. Okay, okay, so so it's out there and, and, and some great stuff there. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for your time, David, and thanks everybody for coming. Okay, thanks very much. Take it easy, guys. All the best. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.